Now, you may have caught it. Uh, she said, uh, blowed up the Death Star. Um, well, that's not a correct uh, use of the word, of, of, of ED at the end of the word, of blowed. Uh, in most cases, putting an ED at the end of the word is correct, but that's not the way the word uh, blow is put into the past tense. And so that was an example of how uh, she overgeneralized this uh, grammatical rule that she had a mental representation of, even though she never really would have been rewarded for using it that way in the first place. So there's an example of, some, of a finding of, of, of some ideas that came from outside of psychology that again showed that in order to understand human behavior, um, you, you need to at least partly start to uh, appeal to some internal mental processes. Even further from uh, the field of psychology uh, were um, uh, influences from the work of engineers and mathematicians uh, like Claude Shannon, who was an engineer and mathematician at uh, Bell Telephone Labs in the United States. Uh, and his whole research agenda was simply uh, trying to understand how um, messages could be uh, spoken to a phone, for example, and then broken down into, a, into little bits of information that could then easily be transmitted across distances, distances and then uh, reassembled so that the receiver or the listener could uh, make sense of this message, could, could understand this. Uh, and just this very idea that you could start trying to understand how information itself is processed through a series of steps uh, lent respectability to this idea that we can treat the mind the same way. This idea that you could start to understand uh, the human mind by focusing on information itself, how it is encoded and how it might be stored and how it might be reassembled, um, began to uh, really make its way into uh, areas of research in psychology proper. So for example, um, George Miller was a famous cognitive psychologist who studied um, memory and tried to understand how we remember things as a function of how information is broken down and encoded and stored. In the field of attention, um, Donald Broadbent uh, developed theories of how uh, attention could be characterized as a series of filters through which information itself was uh, either filtered out or allowed to pass through. Gradually, more and more, this focus of information as a, as a focus of, uh, of, of, of investigation and how this could be used to understand the human mind became more and more uh, popular and the field started to buzz with excitement. The usefulness of uh, understanding the mind as an information processor uh, really began to become exemplified in fields such as computer science where uh, investigators like Herbert Simon and Alan Newell showed that you could uh, get computers to mimic some rudimentary uh, aspects of human cognition. They programmed simple computers to prove theorems. They developed what they called a general problem solver uh, that could solve geometric theorems and arithmetic puzzles, arithmetic puzzles and even play chess. And so by showing that you, by, by treating computer information processes, um, by getting computers to process information that allowed them to mimic uh, human cognitive processes, just showed that there was real fruitfulness to trying to understand the mind as an information processor itself. So ultimately, what you had in the 1950s and 60s was a convergence of findings uh, from psychology and linguistics, achievements in computer science, uh, research in anthropology and, and neuroscience, and insights from philosophy that all came together all around the same time and converged. And this is what led to this explosion uh, that's known as the cognitive revolution, a truly multiple, uh, a multidisciplinary field uh, that's sometimes referred to as cognitive science. Um, and, uh, and it was from there that um, this flourish, that, that, that cognitive psychology came into its own uh, as a field of investigation.
Before we wrap up with this lecture, I'd like to say a few words about the narrative of cognitive psychology as a field. That is, where it's come from and where it's going. There are a couple of different ways to look at this narrative. Um, the way that you'd probably see it written about the most often is kind of a very clean cut kind of narrative where everything fits together, but it's actually more of a caricature of the field. And the way this sort of clean caricature um, history of the field uh, goes is that the field of psychology became emerged into its own as a science around 1879 uh, when Wilhelm Wundt opened up the first lab dedicated to scientific psychology in uh, at the University of Leipzig. Uh, Wundt did use introspectionism as one of his tools but it was introspectionism was really popularized by students of his such as Edward Titchener. But it was in the um, the wake of this popularity of introspectionism, which had really shonky scientific merit, that behaviorism emerged as a way to try to bring psychology into the fold of a truly objective, um, respectable science. However, as the story goes, um, this many would frame this as a dark time in the history of psychology when mainstream psychologists lost touch with driving questions about how the mind works. It was only in the 1950s and the 1960s that a plucky bunch of cognitively minded uh, upstarts uh, banded together and giving forth, giving rise to what we now call the cognitive revolution. That's the standard narrative. However, the true story, I'd argue, is not quite so clean cut. Things don't fit together quite as smoothly. And I would actually uh, suggest that cognitive, the cognitive revolution, as we call it, is better understood as a cognitive evolution. Because it turns out that there were people studying questions about cognitive processes not only before the dawn of what we now call the cognitive revolution, but before the dawn of where of what we of people of what people generally regard as the uh, the starting point of scientific psychology, for example, in the 1800s, uh, you had people like Feschner and Donders and uh, and Helmholtz trying to understand um, how the mind makes sense of perceptual information around the world. Even earlier than that, uh, you had uh, Al Haytham, uh, an Arabic scholar, who tried to understand um, how perception worked making reference to mental processes along the way. So the, the, the cognitive revolution didn't happen out of nowhere. Another part of the standard story is that during the reign of behaviorism, uh, questions of cognitive processes were taboo and were not explored. But that's not also quite true. You had people like uh, Piaget trying to understand cognitive development in children. You had over in England, Frederick Bartlett uh, trying to understand uh, mental processes that shape uh, how we remember things. Um, you had uh, Jerome Bruner at Harvard, a social psychologist, who uh, tried to understand how uh, children think. Um, and uh, in Russia, Lev Vygotsky, another developmentalist who tried to understand the nature of the relationship between language and thought. Clearly, these are very cognitive questions, and they were occurring during the reign of behaviorism when many textbooks would say that these questions weren't being broached at all. It's also notable that many of these people who I just mentioned uh, were uh, older white men. Uh, so there was a lack of diversity in the field, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to say that the field these days has gotten a lot more uh, diverse. For example, women in cognitive science have been responsible for some of the most important and foundational findings in, co in cognitive psychology uh, over the last uh, several decades. And they have uh, assumed uh, some of the most important uh, leadership uh, positions in the field and started some of the most important initiatives uh, that have shaped the field as we know it today. Another uh, aspect of the standard narrative of uh, cognitive psychology uh, that, that doesn't quite ring true is that the cognitive revolution occurred and replaced behaviorism. But in truth, behaviorism hasn't really gone away. Uh, for example, there's still uh, the Journal of Experimental Analysis of Behavior, which is a thriving journal 
You have the International Association uh, for Behavior Analysis, uh, which has over 7,000 members worldwide. Uh, here in Australia, we have the Australian uh, Learning Group, another uh, group of researchers uh, heavily inspired by the advances made by uh, the early behaviorists. In many respects, I'd say that cognitive psychology didn't actually replace behaviorism, but it evolved from behaviorism. It uh, started to use the, the kinds of objective measures of behavior, uh, things like response times and accuracy on task performance that could be objectively measured to uh, draw conclusions and make inferences about what kinds of things were going on in the mind. So in a respect, uh, in, 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 res in many respects, uh, the way we go about um, uh, pursuing or running cognitive psychology experiments today owes much to the early behaviorists. So we come back to the question of what is cognitive psychology? If you take a look at a textbook, uh, it's easy to get the impression that cognitive, def cognitive psychology is defined by the topics uh, that it covers. So, for example, in uh, most textbooks, including probably the one that you own, uh, there are chapters on memory, attention, decision-making, uh, language, reasoning, and, on, and onwards. Uh, but if you think about it, none of these topics is purely a cognitive topic. We make decisions about the social world. We uh, have memories about, our, um, about the people around us. So these, questions, these topics are of interest to social psychology as well, as they are for clinical psychologists. So I'd say that when it comes down to it, what really s defines, what really characterizes cognitive psychology as a field unto itself is its emphasis on how the mind processes information. And that really was uh, one of the central achievements of the cognitive revolution or as I say, the cognitive evolution, where uh, psychologists and their colleagues in other fields really figured out how to start to understand and study how the mind encodes and stores and uses information itself. There's also another interesting twist uh, to the story of cognitive psychology. Um, remember Ulrich Neisser? He was the... Uh, the uh, cognitive psychologist. He was a psychologist who wrote the first textbook on uh, cognitive psychology in 1967. Well, only nine years later, he wrote another book called Cognition and Reality. And in this book, he actually, and in some ways, bemoaned the, uh, the state of, uh, the, of the field of cognitive psychology, a field that he had helped establish. And the reason he wasn't quite so happy with where cognitive psychology was at the time, this was back in 1976, um, was because he felt that in their enthusiasm to just make little tweaks and try to understand mental processes, cognitive processes, as they worked in the lab, many cognitive psychologists had lost touch with uh, trying to understand the relevance of these processes uh, to how cognition operated in the real world. Again, cognition and reality. Well, I think he had a big, a very strong point there. And I'm happy to say that cognitive psychology has come a long way. Um, so, for example, if you take a look at um, uh, articles uh, and books published today, you not only get um, studies just looking at how mental processes and cognitive processes work in and of themselves, but you get, um, you get researchers trying to uh, understand how these uh, mental and cognitive processes uh, help us understand the way people uh, deal with climate change and make decisions about uh, the environment, uh, or how misinformation spreads uh, on social media, uh, or how uh, radiologists and medical technicians can perform better when they're looking at medical slides and trying to make a diagnosis that's going to be critical for your health. Um, meanwhile, there's also uh, intersections um, that have been established between cognitive psychology and clinical psychology so that we can better understand 
uh, how information processing differs in um, people who suffer from uh, depression and anxiety. So although in 1976, um, Nicer was concerned that um, cognitive psychology had lost touch with its implications in the real world, uh, today I'd say that uh, it very much um, makes connection with the real world. Many of the things that we study in cognitive psychology today uh, have direct relevance on things like how we uh, remember events, which is important, for example, in eyewitness testimony. Uh, they bear directly on safety in the real world. When, for example, as we try to understand, or as we understand more and more, how attention shapes perception and how that might uh, dictate or might guide uh, or determine uh, whether or not we'll see uh, pedestrians who might walk in front of us as we're driving. And the more we understand memory, uh, the better um, advice that we can give to students who are trying to study better for their exams. Even beyond that, uh, if you think about things that might not seem like they fall under cognitive psychology um, at first glance, um, things like, you know, why don't people get along or why do people perceive you know, treat people of other races or other ethnicities as, um, uh, treat them more poorly than they treat members of their own in-group. Um, the space between us, the space between you and me and everyone around us is filled with our cognitions about who we are, the assumptions we make about other people, and this guides our real world behavior. So in many respects, cognitive psychology more and more uh, can help us understand and maybe help us shape a better world uh, for the future. And um, I hope at the end of these series of lectures uh, you are as excited about cognitive psychology as I am. Uh, and uh, I hope that you may even be inspired uh, become uh, another to join uh, the story as the field moves forward.